<laughs> uh, hello there, gorgeous people. This is the Sequential Profit 600 from 1982 in mint condition. Really incredible piece of history in front of me with the Glee Glee mod, uh, which helps fix a couple of the issues that this synthesizer had at release. And tonight we're going to be checking out and trying to answer the question, is this the ultimate vintage synthesizer purchase? We're going to go through some of the presets. We're also going to do some sound design. But the big thing is that if you want to get a two voltage controlled oscillator per voice synthesizer from the 70s or 80s, this is actually the cheapest one you can get. I was looking on Reverb and eBay today and I saw one of these uh, for in post-Norwegian synth deflation prices uh, for about $1,600, which is about $400 less than they used to be. And $1,600... Uh, puts it pretty much in, in the same neighborhood as a brand new sequential Take 5. Now, there's a bunch of reasons the Take 5 is going to be uh, better. It's got built-in effects and stuff if you're just comparing features, right? That's going to be true with all modern synthesizers to vintage synthesizers. But if you care about having a piece of history and you want the authenticity of a synthesizer from the 80s, uh, so you're never you're not playing that game with yourself like ah, I think it sounds kind of like the 80s. No, this actually is how it sounds in the 80s. I think it's awesome that you can get a synthesizer this cool um, for sixteen hundred dollars, and that's also known as for Behringer Pro 800. So Behringer recently cloned the synth, and they added an extra two voices and made it a desktop unit, and it sounds. Well, I'll leave that whole Behringer thing to the side because, uh, you know, that is what it is. But if nothing else, I think it's brought some attention to the synthesizer, well-deserving uh, synthesizer buzz that this needed to get. Um, and essentially what this was when it came out in 1982 is the first synthesizer with MIDI and Dave Smith, the creator of the Prophet 5, as well as the inventor of MIDI, Use this hooked up to a Roland Jupiter 6 to show how MIDI worked, which was a really cool sort of, um, you know, bipartisan isn't the right word, but working with all of the synthesizer industry to come up with a universal standard for synthesizers talking to each other is still one of the greatest moments in the history of synthesis. I will shut up soon. Uh, last thing to really talk about is uh, I think that's all I have to talk about. So we'll go into some presets and we'll just start with preset 01. And it's a nice little uh, profit sound. Let's keep going. Nice big pulse with. big string sound. Interesting how the release cuts out. I think that's part of what's interesting about the synth is it has sort of a sharp drop off to the release. That's fixed with the Glee Glee mod. And we've hit upon already one of the, holy shit, that is a long release. One of the features that really set the Prophet 600 apart from its predecessor, the Prophet 5, which I think needs no introduction. By the way, should just say that oscillators A and B are the exact same oscillators as the Prophet 5 Rev 3, which are CM3340s. They're also used in the Oberheim OBXA. A bunch of other famous vintage synthesizers used these oscillators. And the filter is a slightly different Curtis Electro music chip than the one in the Prophet uh, 3, but essentially they're very close. Here's something you can't do on a Prophet 5, though, is polyphonic glide. Aquatic, that is right. It does have a sequencer built in. Um, so that would be another thing. That's another really cool feature. Uh, there's a few other things that are tucked away in here that we'll cover as we're going. Um, so this is more than a cut down Profit 5. In a lot of ways, this is actually souped up compared to a Profit 5. Uh, the biggest emission that I can see is there's no noise source. So if you want noise as a, a mixed into the oscillators, I don't think that's in here. So that's one thing to consider. Thank you. 
kind of nice clangy sort of uh, cross mod thing. So what I think is happening here, it's hard to know exactly, but it sounds like it's using an envelope to control um, the, what is this? The pitch of oscillator A. It looks like using the polymod section, you can use the filter envelope to control the pitch of uh, the first oscillator. So, so the release is dropping way down. Wow, what a cool feature. And we could turn that off and you'd hear. That's another reason why I think this might be the best vintage synth to buy in 2024. Um, and the reason I say 2024 is, again, it's after the great Norwegian synth deflation. Um, but the thing is, is that unlike a bunch of my other favorite vintage synthesizers that are two VCO per voice, like the Yamaha CS70M and the Chroma Polaris, Fender Chroma Polaris, which are both more expensive for sure. Um, this is also all not one knob per function, basically. There's a couple of features tucked away under some menu diving, but a lot of it's right here, and that's a really great thing. I suppose those synths have that too, but they're very expensive. Ow. Hey, Rich, how's it going? And that was some filter FM we're listening to. We'll get more into that later. How's it going, parbs? And you can hear that that glide can go very slow if you want it to. Why, yes, this is an emergency broadcast. Um, really cool filter FM sound effecty type stuff. Oh, that's beautiful. As far as organ sounds go, can I get some scum organs in the chat? <laughs> and then it's as easy as just adding release and attack. You know, you, you can modify every program very quickly. beautiful uh yes good old filter fm that's what's going to and that's another great thing about this synth is that you know compared to some other synths that i have like over here i don't know how well you can see it but i have an oberheim matrix 6 um this synthesizer is filter fm too but you have to go menu diving so the fact that you have it right here in the polymod section super easy to access that's awesome i think filter fm is one of those things that's not really as discussed among vintage synth snobs and I think it should be it's a really cool feature and it does breathe life into a synthesizer from being just kind of your standard you know I'm tired of hearing Juno 106 style you know string patches or whatever like this one <laughs> gorgeous uh so this synth can do that right it's not uh cold because it has curse chips um so a nice old um little clavichord type thing really gets across the uh vowel-y character of this curtis chip
were talking about the chip, uh, the 3372 chip that I believe that's the number for the filter chip is the same one used in the Fender Chroma Polaris, as well as the Prophet T8. And most interestingly, the Oberheim Matrix 12, probably the most expensive Oberheim um, that you're going to get your hands on. Uh, the most interesting, most powerful of the Oberheim vintage synths. So... That's that type of sound. How's it going, Miles? By the way, Miles' cat, Ruffles, needs a little bit of help. Been in and out of the vet. Miles, I hope you wouldn't mind putting the link to your GoFundMe in there. I would love, love, love for some of the people here, if you got a little extra money, five bucks or whatever, to throw some money uh, towards that GoFundMe because the only thing more important than synthesizers is cats. It's good to see you, my friend. Aquatic says, I've heard this since described as being a bit more harsh aggressive than a Prophet 5. Don't know how true that is. Well, I think it's an interesting thing. Technically, the filter is different than a Prophet 5 Rev 3, but it's the same oscillators as a Prophet 5 Rev 3. Uh, but people even said the Rev 3 wasn't as warm sounding as the Rev 2, which is based off the SSM filters. Now, when we did the comparison between the SX240 and something like the Oberheim, um, Matrix 6, which has Curtis chips. I, everybody in the chat voted they preferred the sound of the CEM chips over that of the um, the SSM chips, which I thought was really interesting because generally speaking, vintage synthesizers that have SSM chips sell for more money. So it's an interesting little whatever. Having said that, I will say that having played around with this one a little bit, there is a harshness to it. Um, yeah, for sure. John Richardson, welcome to the stream. How's it going? Um, yes, so... One thing is, is that the resonance gets crazy quick. So let's... Like, you can't necessarily get that type of sound on some other sense. To my ears, it actually sounds very similar to an Akai X60 because of that extreme resonance. That's a beautiful sound. So yes, it can do sync. Really great little sync sound, and it's great playing it in uh, fully polyphonic. That is a gorgeous e piano sound. Let's just add some release. We could route a little bit of uh, LFO mod to the oscillators. And then just dial that back really far so we can get a little bit more of this really beautiful sort of you definitely got one oscillator tuned really high to sort of give you that electric piano time this is one of my favorite i mean come on Uh, Miles, I mean, I don't know if this is as good as a Prophet 5. I don't have one. I don't have a Rev 4 or a vintage one. Uh, so I can't really say, but I would say for me anyways, that's one of my favorite analog, fully analog e-piano type sounds I've heard. Um, so yes, yes, yes. Uh, John says, life is dull without a cat. No doubt. I agree with that. Just back from Mexico. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is cash money, my friend. That's this type of sound I'm not... Interesting, the lack of release on some of these patches.
one thing you might notice is that there's you can hear the voice stealing going on. Part of that's actually because when I was going into this live stream tonight, I noticed that one of the filter uh, filters was a little bit out of tune, meaning that every sixth note I played, because this has six voices instead of five, like a Prophet 5, was the filter would do something weird. It would be either, either a little too open or a little too closed. So I decided, and a, a really cool feature of the synth that I haven't seen in another vintage synth of this era is the ability to actually just able to actually just isolate that voice, turn it off, and turn this Prophet 600 into a Prophet 500. So there's a little bit more voice stealing than you'd usually get for a synthesizer like this, but at the same time, it's still the same number of voices as a sequential Prophet 5 or Take 5. So that is what it is. <laughs> That's a great little brassy thing. And you can push the uh, mixer pretty hard. Yeah, really great. Uh, made again from some of the same components that you would find in an Oberheim OBXA. So if you're going for that type of sound, you could do worse than with something like a Prophet 600. If you're interested in buying a vintage synthesizer from the 80s, here's a real quick guide, right? Most of the synthesizers, analog synths, not talking digital, uh, from the 80s actually use digitally controlled oscillators, meaning the tuning of the oscillators are controlled not by analog voltage, but from a digital clock, which makes the tuning really great, which was seen as a massive improvement because anybody who's ever tried to take an old vintage synth like this on stage will learn the hard way that they get thrown out of tune really quick. And that is very bad if you're trying to sound good live. So actually starting in the very early 80s, the DCO technology came out and synthesizers like the Juno 106, uh, really it was the Juno 6 that was the first one to come out, came out with these really well-tuned oscillators. But nowadays, us cork-sniffing vintage snobs, gonna get some scum snobs in the chat, we want to hear those imperfections in vintage circuitry. We wanna hear those oscillators sort of drift in and out of tune, whether it be from the temperature of the room or little you know, noise that's inherent in the power, the electricity running through this thing. And so voltage controlled oscillators usually sell or since that use voltage controlled oscillators usually sell for a lot more money than the DCO counterparts. Now, what's interesting is if you ask yourself, okay, I want to get a voltage controlled oscillator synth, you could get something that's sitting right above this Prophet 600 or something like the AK, uh, the AX60, which is just catty corner over here. I don't know how well you can see that. Um, but those only have a single voltage-controlled oscillator per voice. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, I want that really lush voltage-controlled oscillator thing. And it's surprising how few options you have when you're talking about synthesizers that don't cost a fortune. So there's really only a couple, and that would be the sequential six-track which technically only has one VCO per voice, but you can dual stack it up for a three voice to VCO synth, but that doesn't really count, right? Those go for about $1,000. Then you came to this guy. This is actually the cheapest way to get two voltage controlled oscillators per voice. And these guys used to go for about $2,000 to $2,500 after the great Norwegian synth deflation. I was able to find one today on Reverb for $1,600, which is pretty incredible. The next jump doesn't really, you're not gonna find another two VCO synth until you get to the Fender Chroma Polaris. Those hang anywhere from 2000 and 2500 I would say, to 3500 And then going up from there, it's probably the Jupiter 6, which you could maybe get for about 5000 So there's really not that many vintage synthesizers that have two voltage-controlled oscillators per voice that are less than $5,000 that mere mortals can purchase. Or what I like to think of is the sweet spot for vintage synths, where they are not so differently priced than if you were to buy a new synthesizer today. Um, I don't think everybody should buy vintage synths, but I think a lot of people want that authentic vintage 70s, 80s sound. And sure, there's a bunch of synths that are out today that claim to be recreations of that. But when you actually can buy one of these synths at such a reasonable price, it makes me wonder why anybody would spend the money on a recreation 
when you could just have the real thing. Um, so I think for a lot of people, especially if you're a producer who uses mostly VSTs or something, there's an argument to be made to just buy this one synth because this kind of covers all the ground. Maybe. You guys let me know what you think. Um, Gerald, welcome to the stream. How's it going? OB, what is what was that? OB8 can deactivate voices? That's cool too. One of those, uh, what do we call those? Um, uh, clav? What a horrible sound. So, sorry about that long-winded rant there, but... There's a lot of presets, and we'll get into some sound design too. I just want to give everybody a taste of the flavor of the synth. these sync sounds let's increase the decay wow regal welcome to the stream how's it going uh parb says do you think vintage synths will drop further in price i haven't really noticed them changing much here in australia I do not think they're going to drop further in price. I think the synth market, like a lot of synth or a lot of the market in general, got super inflated around 2020. Um, you know, overall inflation is up about 26% here in this country. And like a bunch of other things, it's just right now, uh, money's gotten tight. Inflation's been hurting people. So things have fallen a bit in price. So my recommendation is if you want to buy a vintage synth, now is a great time. I don't think the prices are going to fall much further. I think they just aren't selling for quite what they used to be, which is great for if you're buying synths. Not so great if you just bought a synthesizer and you want to sell it now, because unfortunately right now is probably not the best time. Like if you are, if you bought some vintage synths, even one, I would hold on to it for a bit. I would just be like, okay, this is, we got to let this uh, mature a little bit. can predict the future, but that would be my guess. What a sick unison. Wow, that resonance, though, gets so crazy so quick. Hans. Hans Volt, welcome to the stream. Black man, welcome to the stream. Dub station, did you mean to hide black man? I don't think his comment was that bad. I don't know if it was. He's usually been cool. I don't know if that might have been a butt hiding. The one thing I'll say about that filter, which is very powerful, is you're not really hearing the spread, the analog randomness that you get from, say, an Oberheim OBX. Alex Ball just put out an amazing video covering that synth. And you can really hear that as each one of those voices, there's some difference in the way that filter falls, which really gives you that, that characteristic uh, Tom Sawyer type sound. Let's see if we could create that. <laughs> But I will say that the character of the filter is not 100% what, you know, depending on what you're looking for, this is a sharp filter, isn't it? I mean, 
the power though is there. Now if I take the resonance even just a little bit further, it'll start to be a little bit too much, won't it? No worries, Nick. Welcome back to the chat, black man. Um, Hans, we were talking about the Oberheim Expander recently, and you were saying that it's not maybe aggressive enough. I would say this synth is certainly aggressive. Um, this does have the updated CPU. This is a legally uh, modded profit 600 so let's talk about that for a second by the way though can i get a scum can i get a scum cheers in the chat i don't have a good camera here but i just want to say cheers to all you awesome human beings for making every wednesday night here on youtube fucking amazing so cheers to you guys yeah mm. drinking stolen tequila um so the thing about gleegly i think there's a few things it addresses and for those of you who don't know when the Prophet 600 came out, because the CPU is controlling so much of the synth, so the um, envelopes are digitally controlled, unlike the analog envelopes of the Prophet 5, uh, the CPU just didn't seem to be powerful enough for that. And that's caused some problems. One of them is that the envelope shapes were weird. So you would have this very strange, not very musical envelope shape. And in particular, the release, if you had the release on, it would just sort of stop after a while. It was almost like a um, uh, 909 crash where it just is fading out and then it just chokes, right? Which is a weird thing. Another thing is you didn't have smooth control of the filter cutoff. <laughs> So Gleegly, the Gleegly mod adds that. And the other big thing is controlling these oscillators. Now, because we've pulled up a program, it might not be in Gleegly mode. I'm, I don't know enough about how this works. This is my first time going through the presets. Uh, I do. I like to do that live. That way you can see my authentic reactions to things. Um, but we could probably check it out pretty quick. Um, So this is a good example of how the, it's very hard to get the tuning of these perfectly with this coarse tune knob. Actually, I think this is Glee Gleed, but just in semitones. What that means is, you know, as you turn this knob, you're getting different semitone values, which is nice because you can get different tuning type stuff. So that's something that wasn't possible. It's not impossible to get that exact value, but it was just a bitch um, with the frequency knobs were just coarse tune and they were just, uh, apparently a lot of people didn't like them. I didn't have experience with it. I didn't grow up in the 80s. Um, and then I think there's a couple of other improvements they made to it, but I'd say the big ones are just the frequency knobs have been fixed so that you can get either octaves or semitones. And the cutoff is now smooth action, which by the way, stepping filters is common on almost all of the vintage synths that I have in this room from the 70s and 80s, or really from the 80s. I think in the 70s, everything was too analog. Um, but basically, as soon as you could have uh, anything digital going on in a synth, you started to see stepping happen with the filters. And it even happens with the my beloved Chroma Polaris that I love very much. Uh, talk about a redundant sentence. But the uh, filter does step in that. So if there is some sort of Gleegly mod for the Chroma, I would absolutely do that as well. Um, let me catch up the chat real quick here. Uh, see you in a bit, John. Um, yes, 80s was a wonderful time. Let's check out some more patches here. That's how you can get those sorts of THX sounds. What the hell? Why would they do that? Sorry about that, guys. Rip eardrums. Oh, gorgeous. Love 
that sound. I don't know if it counts as an organ. If it does, then I guess I'm team organs. This is like a really nice sort of thin... Really sort of nice... Brass lead with some cool... Comp I would throw some compression and maybe some chorus and delays on that, or maybe no chorus, just keep it really pure. Another thing the Gleegly mod can do, and so I just noticed this because this is a very bright sound, is the Gleegly mod can limit the cutoff so that it doesn't go quite as high, so it has more of a vintage sound like what you would hear on the um, on, a, on a Prophet 5. So that's another thing that it's added on there. Uh, Hans Volt, the expander filter steps. See, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, an expander is like a $7,000 instrument from the 80s and probably the most powerful vintage synth um aside from its even more expensive double cousin the matrix 12 and that in and of itself has a stepping filter so it's just something you get used to when it comes to synthesizers from this era Okay. <laughs> really love this sort of thing. I wonder, I guess it's a square wave. Really cool uh, sounds that you could get out of this. Getting all the way into some of the cross mod stuff that the Prophet 5 is famous for. Um, Black Man says, I remember the thing choking under MIDI control by a sequencer, and yeah, the stepping, yeah. So that's another thing, like with this synth, a uh, few other synths that I have, JX3P comes to mind. If you try to hit it with MIDI, any sort of control, at the same time you have the sequencer running or you're trying to send MIDI information, it just like all falls apart. Um, CPUs just weren't that powerful back then and they were really trying to push what they could get out of a synth and in the case of something where the envelopes are digitally controlled that's a major problem isn't it um, Parb says I never really looked up the Prophet 600 but it seems so versatile um, I have to play running up that hill at least once a stream right yes uh, absolutely <laughs> interesting you meant mentioned the uh dx gerald because i'm so used to thinking of since as in this era as they relate to oh shit the dx7 just came out what are we gonna fucking do that's kind of the zeitgeist of all of the analog synth uh com companies that came out uh or that were making sense at the same time as the dx7 it was the new hotness yo thank you for subscribing the thing is is that this synth came out right before so you actually kind of get a different, you know, so sonic palette. Really nice sort of... Can't tell if that's using the polybod. It is. So you get these weird sort of cyclical little textures when you use uh, the filter FM. So that's what you're actually hearing here is filter FM. And I think it's the detune from the oscillator. Gives you that cyclical thing. It's like a very bright version of Pulse With Mod, which is super cool. More filter FM. Wow, really interesting patch. I don't really know what I'd use it for. Oh, fuck that. Fucking organ. Another nice, uh, just classic brass sound. Ooh, this one's like a nice Juno-y. I was saying earlier that I don't love that, but... This one's good. 
good though. I think what's interesting is that um, when it comes to this, it is a little bit colder sounding, isn't it? I don't know what you guys think. Um, I'll absolutely have to shoot this synth out against a couple of the other synths in the room, especially the Chroma Polaris, I would think. Maybe a couple of other ones. Matrix 6 comes to mind as well. Just because they're similar price points from the two big American companies, aside from Moog. Um... I don't know if I feel like there's the warmth there on the oscillators. Now, of course, what you could do is just add the triangle wave in. So this is a super cool thing. Um, someone who knows the Prophet 5 better than I can answer this question. But could you turn on the sawtooth, triangle, and square wave all at once? I thought like you could just have one or the other on the Prophet 5. I could be completely wrong about that. Mighty Pinto, welcome to the stream. How's it going, my friend? Uh, Garen, welcome to the stream. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, Parbs, yeah, then it was all, oh shit, the M1 is out. What are we going to do? Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, it, it sold for more back then after the great, uh, that I'm talking to black man here, after the great Norwegian synth deflation, things are different. Garen says, just a ride, had a profit 600 years ago. Loved it. Great little synth. But yeah, the Z80, that's the CPU, got run over pretty easily. Um, Gleagly upgrade fixed a lot of these issues, but it came out after I've sold mine. Uh, Dub says the Gleagly mod is no longer available. I didn't know that that was the case. Grab it while you can. It's, um, it's on a discontinued teensy Arduino. No one had come up with a new one yet. Holy shit. Gerald says, I assume the presets are new. No, so these presets are from way back when, I believe. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Todd Phipps, welcome to the stream. Little stereo chorus and verb, and that would be a really nice pad. Yeah, so that's another thing about this synthesizer is it is, in fact, not stereo at all. It is a truly mono synth. It's got one output out the back, which is how it should be, God damn it. Uh, and then you can just use my free plugin Inktomi for vintage chorus effects if you want to do that. I thought about using it on the stream, but um, yeah, that seems like that. Uh, let's see. Here. Tom says the price of the B is certainly right, considering if the module works for you. Oh, you're talking about Behringer. Yes. So it is the case that a brand new Behringer uh, Poly 800 is going to be about a quarter the price of this. And um, so there's going to be some people who buy that just out of the fact that it is that price. I would really like to take a second, um, if you've made it this far in the live stream or you're watching this video in the future, Nick, if you could explain your experience with the, with the Poly 800 from Behringer, because I think that would be valuable to a lot of people. Um, and this is a reason why, unlike what Behringer said, where it's like all these so synth influencers don't want to support them anymore. That is not my complaint. Whatever their politics and the way they are i don't want to get involved with that but when i talked to nick about his experience with the poly 800 that was one of the formative experiences for me for and and something that confirmed what i keep seeing in my comment section and of course like right after that i picked the ugliest sound possible to make on the vintage synth oh my god it's uh We get some X-Files action happening. Wow. Really intense sound like an analog piano. Yes, that sound mighty is absolutely um, that sort of a thing. Garrett says, about the Pro 800, I said Poly 800, it's a Pro 800, I apologize, because I wanted to have the 600 again, but couldn't afford it. The Pro 800 has been great, and it does nail the sound. Um, Boredom and Bedlam, welcome to the stream, not the greatest instruments made by Behringer. 
Um, Garen says, really, the Pro 800 is really well built. Well, I'm glad that that is the case for you because I haven't heard that from everybody. So it just, I think it's one of those things where however many of them are made and how many go out, it's a ratio. Every company is going to have problems with their sense. There's no such thing as like, even the really expensive ones like Moog. I guarantee you, and actually it was the case that there were many Moogs being sold for $5,000 that had problems, right? That's just the nature of manufacturing. And that's not anybody should, should, shouldn't get docked for that occasionally happening. But it seemed to happen a lot with the Pro 800s. So that's again using the incredible um, polymod section. Why don't we take a second to actually get into some sound design? So if you just hit the preset button and turn it off, all of a sudden the synthesizer becomes basically like a, um, just like it, it's in panel mode. <laughs> um, let's see, let's turn off, let's just get a saw to it. sound going like 50% on everything. Right, so we have ourselves a, you know, it's a simple sawtooth wave. I would love to know everybody's opinion about that sawtooth wave because to my ears, it's a little, it's a little thin, which is surprising considering it's the exact same sawtooth from the Prophet 5. I don't know if I'm just crazy. And then of course we can blend in the other oscillator and the detune is really nice. So just that on its own is a very nice sound. Uh, we have, let's just turn off oscillator B real quick and we can turn on, so yeah, we can turn everything off. We can turn on the triangle wave. We add some of the, um, can add a little, uh, you know, Legend of Zelda 2 action. Right, by adding the LFO to the pitch of the oscillator. So that's the triangle wave. That's basically all you would think it would be. And we've got the square wave. Now immediately to me, that sounds actually... I would be curious to know like a harmonic analysis of that sound because it actually sounds quite... Um, let's see if I can wedge my phone in here. Seems like I lost it for a second. Um, it sounds like it's quite of a thinner and actually has some of that sawtooth harmonics in it to my ear. Definitely thinner to my ear. Really great buzz though. I mean, I definitely could give it that. Um, but yeah, the pulse width, we can go all the way through zero. Yeah, so we could get that sort of sound. It, it's interesting that it can go through zero at about 7.5 of 10. So five is being neutral. And at 
three o'clock. We've already gone, so there's really not a lot happening in the tail end here. I don't know exactly what purpose that is, why it wouldn't be just set to being at like 100% at about 10 or so. This is the way it is. Turn on the second oscillator. Am I crazy or does that sound a little thin? That is not getting that huge low end that we sometimes get from these old synths, which actually isn't a problem when it comes to poly synths, by the way. You know, it's fun to hear a lot of low end with a synthesizer, especially with a filter sweep. But what I've learned from mixing and mastering music uh, as my sort of career is that uh, you don't really want a poly synth to have too much low end. You want like a bass synth to have crazy amounts of low end, something like MS-20 or whatever. Uh, for this, it's actually not a bad thing. I think of like the memory mode and the way that that filter can actually scoop out some of that low end. I actually think that's quite a good thing. Uh, so in this case, yeah, it's definitely a little bit thinner than some of the other polys. I'd be super curious to know about how this would stack up against the Chroma Polaris, which has different oscillators, but the same filter, you know? And that filter's implemented very well, whereas with this one, we just get crazy resonance quick. Oh, I've got some polymod on. That might be part of the thinness. It just is um, thin. Nick says, can't stand that Behringer rips off ideas from small indie Eurorack designers. Eurorack makers aren't rich by any standard and are the ones pushing synths forward and Behringer steals their livelihood. Yeah, to me, that's a major issue. You know, if you want to revitalize some old synthesizers that other people aren't making, that, in my opinion, is fine. You know, the fact that Korg isn't making a monopoly, which is beyond me, by the way, but the fact that they're not, you know, go ahead and make it, whatever. Um, when they copy small companies and they steal their stuff by basically looking at what's selling in the Eurorack world, uh, that's a shame. So, but I never want anybody who's watching these videos to feel any shame at all directed towards them for buying Behringer stuff. I have some Behringer stuff over there. No shame at all there. It's not your fault. It's not your fault that they've done what they've done, right? And if you enjoy their stuff, and a big part of it is that it's affordable. That's good. I like that they put pressure on other companies to make affordable gear. That's a good thing. I just wish there wasn't this other side to the company that sort of tarnishes that. Um, if it was just that they put out really good gear at a cheap price, I would be the biggest supporter in the world. Um, so yeah. I love that you say Hans, you're like, I have five Behringers and I still hate them. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Let me see if I can get that wedged right. Yeah. So not so thick sounding, uh, we can add some pulse width modulation from the LFO. So I just hit this little switch on and. And you can hear the pulse width mod can go through zero. Which is super cool. Uh, we could slow that down and make it less crazy. To get really big, beautiful string type sounds, we could just increase the release. sounds beautiful uh really quick way so immediately I, i'm struck by how wonderful the oscillators are for polysynth sounds they are not the thinnest or i'm sorry they are not the thickest though and i do have a sickness for the thickness so you know take that with what you will 
Gleegly allows us to have a bunch of different uh, shapes for the LFO. Uh, I don't remember if all of them were in the original Prophet 600. That's something to be interested in. Um, yeah. I think that um, as far as the oscillator section goes, it is good, but not great. Let's go ahead and check out the sync. So it's going to sync the two oscillators together. Now to get some interesting stuff to happen, we actually need to increase some poly mod uh, to the uh, filter or the oscillator A. Oh, that's some pretty sweet sound. So that's syncing together the um, oscillators here. Oscillator B, uh, I'm sorry, oscillator A, the uh, is forced to restart its cycle every time oscillator B. I always get that wrong. I want to make sure I say that right. Essentially, you're using one oscillator um, is, is forcing the other oscillator to be in tune with it. Which, by the way, if I turn the filter envelope off, right, and we just... You can hear they're in perfect tune. If I turn sync off, you'll hear the detune. If I turn it on, locked in phase and tune, and that's what gives you that sync sound as you adjust the tuning here. But what's interesting is it stays in tune. Maybe I did that backwards. Yeah, I did that backwards. So what's interesting is this stays in tune. This is a way that you could get those really great e piano sounds too. Because you've got those really high harmonics, right? sort of uh, way to get those types of sounds out of it. So anyways, let's turn that back down to where we were before and turn sync off. How does everybody feel about the sound of the synth so far? I mean, it's going to get interesting as we approach um, the filter, right? So we could turn on the sawtooth waves as well. And to my ear, it's not that different. So... We actually lose volume because of the smart attenuation going on. So with it off, just pulse waves, and then with it on, we don't really get too much of a difference. I think what's a very smart thing, though, is having this triangle wave. So essentially what the triangle wave is going to help beef up those oscillators and give us some low end. Now we've got plenty of low end. If you were missing the thickness before, I agree with that aquatic. Um, I think the triangle wave helps get us really big sounds. the triangle wave. So, you know what's interesting about it is 
my brain knows that I should really design sounds with this, with those, those triangle waves off because they're not going to help with polysynth sounds. Again, unless you're doing something like a bass sound, it's probably just going to be muddying up your mix. But I can't help but want that bass there when I'm playing a vintage synthesizer, right? I want that roundness, that fullness as we're going. So, um, <laughs> Autumn says that Z wants to tell you hello. How's it going, Z? It's good to see you, Xander. Hope you're doing well, my friend. Um, so let's go ahead and turn those off for a second and go back to just the sawtooth wave and we'll play a low octave. We're gonna get real low. Right? Now if I kick the triangle waves on. Really thick. But we'll leave them off. Just want to make sure I got that in tune there. Sizzle me timbers. So we'll go ahead and try to do a little bit of a filter sweep. Fuck it, we'll put the trunk wave on. With no resonance, let's go ahead and do nine o'clock. Really nice growl there. Nice little approaching some valleyness. Now, because I know this filter is going to get crazy quick, we're going to do like ten thirty. I am very excited to shoot this synth out against the Chroma Polaris because to my ear, it's got a really sh sharp characteristic to the filter, but I don't really feel that on the Chroma Polaris. So I'm, I'm interested to know what's going on here. Noon. That's a very nice, very vowely, talky sort of sound. That actually sounds really good. Evan, welcome to the stream. Uh, to my knowledge, this is not the keyboard's not been rebuilt, and it feels great. Actually, I would rank it up there with. A very nice key bed. I, I, I wouldn't, um, there's plenty of them where I'm not that into it. Absurd, welcome to the stream. <laughs> I'm sorry, Z, it took me a bit there. I don't always see every mess. Let's go ahead and crank the resonance up a bit more. Really doing that Curtis Chip chirpy sort of character to it. Kind of crazy though, the way the filter characteristic is. It's very counterintuitive to me how it sounds. I would not have guessed because I thought I knew what it sounded like with the Chroma Polaris. Same filter. Like the way that it sounds like there's these sirens, like ghosts singing in the background. That's a very different filter sound that I'm used to.
dogs are dying next door. Let's go ahead and go to three o'clock. So it's going to get crazy. I'm dialing the volume back. So yeah, the, the filter can get pretty out of control very fast. And that's nine o'clock. We'll go ahead and go to 10. I'll bring the volume way back. It's interesting, you still get the filter sound in there. It's not really, I, I don't know if it's really that different from, you know, we're at uh, 5.30 or whatever we can get here, but it's not that different. Yeah, it's really not doing any difference. You can watch me as I move this resonance knob. Nothing really occurring. It's like maxed out um, pretty early, which is kind of crazy. Um, so yeah. Blackman says, my friend had a Polaris. It sounds better than most, if not at all, budget early 80 cents, despite the membranes. Yeah, I um, I myself love, love, love the Chroma Polaris. When we shot it out against the AX60 was when I really fell in love with it. And I realized that is a special synthesizer. So yeah, I would say that the filter is pretty guilty of that sound, right? That sound that's so familiar. But it can sound good. But the beefiness of the oscillators isn't really there, even with that triangle wave. It's kind of crazy to me. Right? It's just kind of, um, it's, it's pretty intense. So let's go ahead and bring that back and increase the um, poly mod. Now what we can do is take oscillator B's frequency and route that to the cutoff of the filter, right? So we're gonna do that and just increase that with some resonance and we'll see what happens. We'll do it without any, we'll just see what happens. The first thing you'll notice is it sort of seems to brighten up the sound. Um, let's see, Mark says, would the mod have anything to do with it, how the filter is acting? Yeah, sure, I think it, it very well could have to do with the scaling of the filter. Uh, why they would scale it that way to me is is somewhat strange. Um, I don't know if there's a setting in here. Again, this is really the first time I'm getting a chance to experience the synthesizer live with you guys. So I have not had too much time. I read the Glee Glee manual, but you never really know. Um, but yeah, let's check out this, uh, this the, the difference of when you add some filter FM going on. So you can already hear there's sort of a different timbre to it. That's a very smooth filter sound. If I add a shitload of poly mod, um, or I'm sorry, filter FM. You start to get this interesting thing where it's almost like two cutoff points, right? Do you guys hear that? But really filter FM becomes interesting as you crank the resonance, so. really awesome sound I mean just listen to that sort of like alien purr very wet sound isn't it as we increase resonance And to me, this really reminds me a lot of the Akai AX60. I'd say that the, um, even though they have different filters, I believe, the sound of that filter is very similar. What a sick sound, by the way. Without Polymod on, we're hearing nothing. So it seems to have some influence on the cutoff in this sense, which is interesting. Without it, we just have sort of warmth.
Anyways, we why don't we try adding a little envelope action here so we could try to get sort of like a brass type little uh POB dirty brass sound. So we'll try to get a brass sound to start with, maybe. Like a really heavily resonance brass sound, right? There's also key tracking here. I have it on half right now. like dirty brass so instead of To me, this is such an underused sonic palette of synthesizers from the 70s and 80s, right? This is borrowed from the Prophet 5. So if there was ever a synth that sort of, aside from maybe the Mini Moog, that sort of defined what a uh, analog synthesizer sounds like, it's the Prophet 5, right? Well, this has always been something that synthesizers could do. And yet, I think it's associated with synths like the Prophet 600 and the Akai AX60 as the reason they're considered cold, right? Because they have this sort of thing. Yeah, the POV dirty brass. sound. The VX600, yes. What an awesome sound. And then we could add some more chaos by adding some uh, action to the actual filter from the LFO. Nice slow filter movement. I love this patch. Now, I'd just like to say, though, if we turn the uh, resonance down and the polymod up, we'll actually have to increase the envelope amount, but... This is the sound we're really starting with. It's just like a basic profit brass sound. Which I think sounds pro properly analog. It's actually very bright. Oh, I'm sorry, dark. Wow, I mean, that's a... Oh, sounds good. Right? Versus if we uh, then bring that down a little bit and bring in the poly mod, we get this dirty... And you need the resonance too, or else the poly mod's not really going to do what you're trying to get it to do. Some 
really powerful, nasty. <laughs> Yeah, so that's pretty crazy. Now we do have uh, different LFO shapes, so. We got a, a, a square shape here. Now, if while we're in this mode, we can just go to um, parameter one, it says LFO shape here, and we can now change this. To sample and hold, actually. Uh, I'll turn, but we'll create a, a sample and hold type pad thing. Uh, what is it? Here we go. I mean, how awesome does that sound, right? Now, if we move this back over, and again, we can go to LFO shape, we can move this over to, I believe, a saw. Here we go. So now we can do sort of like a pumping sidechain effect. Now, I think this is a uh, gleegly thing. Someone can confirm this for me. Underview, welcome to the stream. How's it going? Could I compare this to a modern sequential? Well, if you mean a direct comparison, like for me to turn on a modern sequential synth, uh, that's impossible just because I don't own a single modern synthesizer. I have only vintage synths. Um, so sorry about that, Underview. Um, John, welcome to the stream. Sounds like it's going through a distortion pedal. Welcome to the wonderful world of Filter FM. You don't even need one. Um, let's see. Uh, Dub says you need a source of noise for sample and hold. Yes, I would think that's what's going on. Um, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. There's The world of synthesizers does not boil down to the features that a synth has, right? And I've learned that the hard way with some of my synth purchases, where I've bought a synth because it's got so many features I wanted, and it turns out that's not really what's making the sound happen, right? So first and foremost, a synthesizer needs to have the good components that go into it. And so that's a big reason why I love vintage synths is because you know you're getting that authentic. How, if you like music that sounded good back then, right? Not all music sounded good back then, but you like the stuff that sounded good back then. How are you gonna do that? You're gonna get it with vintage components, right? That they were using back then. Um, beyond that, I think that once you've got a good sound, you've got good sounding oscillators running through a good sounding filter, that's when all of that other stuff can add up. And sometimes it really is great. I, for one, really love the effects on the Korg Prologue. I don't love the effects as much on some of the modern sequential stuff that I've heard from demos and things. They sound fine, but they haven't spoke to me in the same way that the effects from the Korg synths did. 
I don't know why that is. Now, at the end of the day, do I even use those effects most of the time? No, I use my own effects plugin, Inktomi, which you can download, links in the description. Um, I use other plugins like the Valhalla stuff, and I like how those reverbs sound. So maybe it doesn't really matter what the built-in reverb is on a synthesizer. But I do think it matters in the sense that if you have a great reverb built into the synth, you'll probably just use it, right? You'll just record it, whatever. That's how it is. And it also changes how you design a patch, right? Because reverb is such an important part of a lot of synth patches nowadays, even back then, all the way, ever since uh, 1982 with Blade Runner, right? So from that perspective, um, I think there is a reason to buy vintage synthesizers. Now, that is from a very privileged person who is very lucky to have so many incredible synthesizers that I get to experiment with who also makes money off of music. Let's not forget about that. Um, and made a lot of money off of music. I would say that when it's a beginner or somebody who just wants to have a really great sound, I would just follow your ears. And some vintage synths might be worth it. Other ones, probably not for someone in that case. If you're not that interested in, you know, the sounds of those old records, right? Which I know I am. I mean, some of my favorite bands are like Knights or Ebb. Um, well, then if that's the case, then, you know, then a great modern analog synth is probably the way to go. It's going to be, you know, more simple. I wouldn't even say they're more reliable. I've had very good luck with my vintage synth acquisitions and... You do need to know a synth tech, but I've bought new synths and had new synths that uh, have broken. So I'm sorry for that ramble, but that would be what I would say. Um, Matrix 12, welcome to the stream. The P6000 sounds awesome through the June 60 chorus. I can only imagine. Welcome to the stream, Jinji. Thank you for stopping by and saying hi. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty good. What are some other sounds you guys would like me to try making? <laughs> so fucking ashamed nick that i don't know the led zeppelin all my love sound even though i was researching it the other day for the trivia i do that by the way there's trivia on this channel uh make a nice pad aquatic borealis uh so absolutely i think that should be doable so the first thing is we'll reset all of our stuff uh our amplifiers to about 50 percent with a little bit more release Oh, and we will turn the uh, LFO off. We don't need that for now. And we will go to the LFO shape and bring that back to something more like a sine wave. There we go. But we'll turn it off for now. Increase some filter envelope. Well, actually, let's get the... Um, so here's one thing that I think is a good general uh, hygiene for sound design. It's actually start with your amplifier envelope because if you get that right, you can really sell a lot. So let's try to make a violin. Well, first off, let's change our oscillators too. Let's just get just some sawtooths and tune them up nicely. Mm -hmm. 
quite a nice little little violin-y type thing. Yeah, underview. I mean, I think it is an interesting thing. Um, Nick points out that uh, another cool feature of Gleegly is modern uh, MIDI CC implementation for sequencing, which is very useful for a lot of producers. Um, let's see here. Have a wonderful night, Autumn. Thank you for stopping by. I love you and Xander very much. Well, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually increase this. So now we have an octave between our our voices. Now, let's turn that off and turn the um, square waves on and we'll just get some nice pulse width modulation happening. So we'll route that to the pulse width. And I just want to add movement to the sound. It's a very bright sound, but we're going to bring this speed a lot slower. Sort of to give it that sound. That's a little much, so I'm going to bring the sawtooth back in. Let's bring the triangle wave in too. So now we really have that fullness, which will be helpful if we want to create a really great sound. Bring the volume back just a little bit more. So we're starting with a very great... Um, oscillator sound and amplifier, right? So by starting with that, we're able to get something. That is very thick, really great. Um, so without even needing to add too much, we've got a good starting point. So we need to take out some of that high end though. First thing I'm gonna do is increase the envelope amount so we can really hear what's going on with the filter. Notice that the decay is really sharp at 50%. I don't know why it cuts off so aggressively. So you need the decay to be a little bit longer on this synth than the attack to get sort of like a smooth up and down sort of shape. amplifier a bit even more so we could get it from being too brassy let's bring the, amp the uh, mixer back a little bit too i feel like i'm just driving it too hard you can really start to distort resonance oh we've still got polymod on that's probably affecting it too so without that that's probably where we're getting that distortion from so we need a lot more decay here and more release for a really big evolving pad resonance so this might be a good time to talk about the um, envelope shape so if I go to five here we got amp envelope shape now if I go um, all the way to the left it's gonna be fast so you can hear how that sounds and if I go uh, I don't know amp shape and I go to the right this will be slow I don't know how t how much of a difference that makes but 
It's something. On the uh, faster shape, the more exponential is going to be more of your um, more analog sounding. And what's so funny is I just did a video on OBXD 3.0 that just came out. And they added a feature, this exact same feature, into that soft synth to give you sort of some control over more of a linear, linear to exponential curve. And it's just so funny to see it in a synthesizer. Now, obviously, it's a Glee Glee modification to the synth, but to, to have the same feature being added into a synthesizer from 1982 is just kind of ironic or crazy to me. Um, holiday blessings to you, to DJ Crystal Love. How are you doing? I see you. Um, yeah. So yeah, the sharpness of that filter is uh, bothering me a bit. We'd also turn the envelope amount down a bit. So we just have a really nice, dark, increase the uh, sustain of the amplifier. I like it not to be all the way open sometimes on pads so it can get out of the way a little bit. now I think now something we can do that I didn't do earlier is actually just detune the oscillators so depending on what kind of pad you want it's going to be that envelope amount you know do we turn the triangles off I think we don't need them This is a little thin sounding. Put it in back in. Maybe just one. Yeah, one. The amplifier attack is really interesting though. Because it's like you still hear it. Like with the amplifier at 10 attack, I don't want to hear anything at first. I want it to fade in, right? So maybe we need to go to amp attack over here and not filter shape, but um, amp shape. Put it to slow. Or fast. See, it's it's not really too much of a difference to me. This is my first major gripe with this synth. Is that amplifier is just like I don't want to hear anything if that attack is slow, right? It doesn't seem to dig deep enough or something. I don't know what the answer is. Why that is that case. Um It's very interesting. I'm looking over here to the side because I know there's a couple of things that we could... Um... Yeah, so what we could do is we could thicken this up a little further we could send the LFO right to the frequency of um, oscillators A and B but that's gonna be just crazy right so we sort of have to sacrifice the pulse width modulation
And it's pretty seasick pretty quick. Almost okay amount. But what I really want to do is now send, if I go to 11 here, LFO, not LFO shape, LFO destination. And I think I can send this just to B. So now the LFO is only sending the pitch modulation. This is a Glee Glee thing to oscillator B. And so we're going to get more detune. We actually back off the detune a bit, maybe just because it's a little out of tune sounding. sound where sometimes the oscillators are a little out of tune sometimes they're in tune so it's really analog sounding modern let's see what happens really just brings the whole thing forward i'm interested how that'll sound with oscillator b out of tune here
still kind of going. <laughs> so, yes, I think that is a good enough place to call it tonight. We'll definitely be doing some more stuff with the Prophet 600 in the future. But I wanted to give it a uh, just quick little overview here. Oh, my God, my light is falling. Loves to do that. The terrible light. Terrible, terrible light. We can just set that there for now, I think. Yeah. Uh, but we will be doing more in the future with the Prophet 600. I just wanted to give a good intro tonight. What is going on? Ah, cable is caught on the stick. Oh my gosh, it's caught on the chair. Chair, I see what's happening here. All righty. The chair was my nemesis, but no more. I have outsmarted the chair in case anybody was worried about that. We will absolutely be checking out more stuff with the Prophet 600, but I want to just give a really fun uh, sort of intro to the synth because I do think it is a really powerful synthesizer. I want to know, though, I'm going to ask you guys sort of a poll. Um, is this the ultimate vintage synth for the price? I want to know what you guys have to say. And you guys can respond with your uh, answers, you know, or like, you know, comment your answer, but I want to get a yes or a no. Uh, and I want to know what people think. Because to me, if you just look at the features, which is sort of interesting in the discussion with what Garen um, and what, uh, what was it, Under was saying, Underview was saying, like, what, what constitutes uh, a great synth? The features list on the Prophet 600 cannot be beat. I do not believe it can be beat by any other synthesizer for what it is. What was the price? So these synths go for, I just saw one today for $1,600 in the post great Norwegian synth deflation. Uh, they used to go for 2,500 or so, which would put it you know, kind of around the Oberheim matrix nowadays, which is a very powerful synth, a lot of the same features no hands-on control, and DCOs instead of VCOs. I think that, again, just looking at the features that the Prophet 600 would have it, would sweep the floor with it. But when it comes to sound, what's crazy is, am I crazy for maybe thinking I like the sound of the Oberheim Matrix? I don't know. Um, Philip, welcome to the stream. Uh, 1,200 earlier this year. Oh my God, what an awesome deal. Um... Yeah, Todd. So that one on reverb is for fifteen hundred and a hundred dollars shipping. So I always talk about prices of synths, including the shipping, um, just because I think that's important. Uh, Mind idiot, welcome. I think the Matrix is better. Yeah, Garen is biased that his first was uh, the his first analog synth was the P six hundred. I regretted selling it the minute I left my hands. Yeah, I could see how if you had bought this synth at some point, how it just would have been so awesome. Um, I'm glad you're here, Mind Idiot. We missed you. Um, someone was telling me the other day that the patch that I made for you for the D50 was used in some TV show, and I'm like, that's nah, not possible. You'll watch me make it uh, live on stream. Um, Aquatic says, the Matrix gets to pleasing sounds easier, but I think there's more to explore on this. I agree with that very much, too. I don't think I've at all plumbed the depths of it. I just want to kind of... I played only half the presets, and I just want to whet everybody's appetite for it. Um... The JX3P is an awesome synthesizer. I mean, as far as like good sounding synths, the JX3P is also very high up there on my list. And you can get a JX3P for relatively cheap nowadays. Um, Todd says, I think the Matrix just has more waveform beef. Um, yeah, that's the biggest thing for me is I was noticing, I was like, do the are these oscillators thin or am I just losing my mind? And that's also why I love doing the Versus streams because it wasn't until I shot the Matrix out against a bunch of other synths that I started to really appreciate it. Because when you hear direct comparisons of like the oscillator and you go, ooh, that oscillator sounds really good on one synth or another. And wow, listen how the resonance is on this one filter versus the other. Then you start to develop a, a sense of like, oh yeah, this synth actually is. Listen to a synth out of context, just on its own, which I have to do for two reasons. One is this was sort of like my intro video for the Prophet 600 and we'll get more in depth with it later. 
Um, but another reason is just because people want to hear how a synth sounds. They don't want to hear how a synth and 24 other synths sound. In general, my videos where I just choose a synth and it's just like, here it is, here's the synth, that is the video that's going to be more popular than when I do the Versus streams. I do the Versus streams more for me and for you guys because I think they're interesting. Um, yeah. There is a special character, Garen, I think, to the P600. Um, yeah. Dogman says, P600 lasted less time than any since I've owned except an Art Nami I got in 79. God, that's insect. Not a fan. <laughs> I love that. All right, so let me look at this. So right now, it is exactly a 50-50 poll. So for everybody who voted no, I want to know what you think the ultimate vintage synth buy is. Price being a relevant factor here, right? We can't all buy CS80s. We can't even all buy CS70Ms. We can't even all buy you know, poly 600 or profit 600. So with that, um, you know, what would be a better alternative for me? jx 3 p is not a bad one. Oberheim matrix six, not a bad one. Those are good synths. Those are very good synths. I'm starting to lose a little bit of my scum snobbiness around VCOs because both the, um, both the profit 600 and Chroma Polaris have VCOs and yet I feel like they there's like I hate it in detune where it starts to feel sharp before you start to feel lush if that makes any sense I don't know what that is exactly but certain synths have that and both the Prophet 600 and the Chroma Polaris have that even though they have different oscillators very similar Hans Volt says the Altair 231 that's that uh, Soviet synth right Nick says, the subtle, dirty buzz and sizzle greater than DCO. I agree with that for sure. And I love my DCOs. I do too. Blackman says, the Polaris for the win. Yeah, that synth has attitude in a good way. That synth just sounds wonderful. Happy holidays, Charles. How's it going, my friend? Um, my name says, is that an oscillator thing or a filter thing, though? Hard to say. Hard to say. It's a mystery. I don't know that there's a... Um, an answer to that but when it comes to detune you know you just want a synth to sound lush um chroma polaris can sound lush but sometimes it sounds a little sharp uh matrix 6 sounds lush jx3p sounds lush lush so i don't know i, I might be losing my vco snobbery you like to think you can hear it but i'm not sure that i can and it's certainly not as big of a thing as like, if you turn the vintage mode up all the way on the new um, GeForce Oberheim OBX plugin, that's that's warbly. <laughs> um, Aquatic asks, did you see Honey Arani's performance on KXXP, KEXP? She had a Prophet 8. Wow. A Rhodes, a piano, and a used, and used Ableton. The Pro and sound on that was so good. One of the best solo performances I've ever seen. I have not, but I need to now. So, for sure. Charles asks, does your Polaris have any sort of oversensitivity with its velocity sensitivity? Good analog machines are also the JX8P, wonderful synth, and the MKS70 Super JX. Yes, I agree with both of those. And yes, the velocity sensitivity, which is something the Polaris has, the, the Profit 600 doesn't. Um, velocity sensitivity in the Chroma Polaris is, is too much. I would pay someone to mod it to dial it back a little bit. Um, currently what I would do is either use velocity on the amplifier or on the filter, but never both because it's just too much. Um, and in general, I just like how powerful it sounds with the, in it. So most people are saying it's not, but there's, it's about 50, 50 or about 56% saying no, but I still want to hear some answers as far as better suggestions for vintage synthesizers for the price. That would be my caveat, right? JX10 is another one of those synths that I think I, um, hopefully one day, maybe. I mean, I've got too many synths, right? The problem is I really need to start selling them, and I don't want to sell any of them. You know, you, d you develop a bond. It's like, could I sell my JX3P? I don't think I could. Probably have one too many DCO synths. Frankly, it's probably the SX240 that should go, but I just, I just don't know that I can let that thing go. 
it's such a fucking beautiful machine and I like using it. I like the sound, but I do admit that when we shot it out against the JX-3P, it didn't really stand up that well. Ugh. I never want to sell since either, Hans. Just, you know, it's kind of the nature of the thing. Um, MPS 70 is really nice. I have the retroactive programmer for it and it's amazing, Charles says. Yeah. Um... Devstation says, not per function, you can't get a comparable, a compar comparable, Jesus, Alex, say the word, uh, vintage DCO. Yeah, I mean, for the price, it's it's very hard to compare it. You you have to get a cheap one and, and a retroactive programmer, you know, or a Novation Mark II. <laughs> um, Todd says, I would probably end up with the JX-8P even though I really love knobs. Kind of matches my K3. Yeah, the K3 is very obviously a JX-8P ripoff. When you look at that synth, you're like, holy shit. Um, Gerald says, release to zero to try to fix attack issue. Um, that might have been it. I don't know. So, I love Wednesday nights too, Mark, and I appreciate you guys for that. Um, would you ever consider an 8-bit? What is that? Are you talking about the Krumar? I thought it was like 99-bit or something like that. What What's the 8-bit you're talking about, Hans? The 6581 SID chip is super raw and dirty. So the SID chip is like in the old computers, right? I believe the same guy who developed the chips for in Sonic ESQ1, the owner of the company. Um, bit 08, bit 99. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's another one on the list, but again, I'm just kind of like getting tired of DCO sense. I mean, they're, they're just sort of, they're very similar. And the thing is, I had Jackie Daggers in the studio yesterday, and we were playing with a bunch of different synths. The thing is, the, all of those synths sound good, but they kind of are all in the same lane. I liked when we would go from one synth to another and be like, whoa, that sounds completely different. Like the K3 sounds different than the rest of the synths in the room, for sure. Um, SY99, then over to the Polyvox, then over to the D50. You know, if you're over in like the DCO lane, kind of over there in the corner, it's like five or six synths that are all nearby each other in terms of sound. Uh, Dub Station says the Insonic Mirage. Yeah, that is a good one. Um, Ex Commodore engineers. Mirage is awesome. I, I sold that synth just because interfacing with it is not as good. And I'm, I'm holding out hope that Rob puts out a retroactive controller for the, um, for my good friend, the DSS one. Sorry, that took me a bit. Um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, they're great. It's just that like, you don't want that sound on everything. So the difference between the lower fidelity chips in the Mirage versus the slightly better, like the DSS one to me is that perfect mixture of vintage digital character where it's still vintage digital sounding, but it's also clear. And that warm, awesome um, DW8000 filter is so good. It's just awesome. Um, Todd says, first time I ever saw a Mirage dad samples in Sonic had hired Rodney Dangerfield to make. Lead said, hey, quit poking me in the ribs. Go bother some other keyboard. That is incredible. Charles says, to get into more modern stuff, the virus is really quite deep. It's a DSP virtual analog, of course, as the Nord lead. Yeah, I've thought about the um, getting an original virus. I actually had, um, I got the plug at Guitar Center and he'll he'll text me pictures sometimes of synths he gets in and it'll be like, yeah, we got a virus C and I've thought about it. But again, I've just got so many synths and I don't want to get too crazy. I mean, I like having new synths because it gives me something to talk about on the channel, but also I want to have the right number of synths and I want the synths I don't use to be used by somebody because someone will love them. So, um, yeah. Hansfeld says, a synth that uses a company or 64 sound chip, but the 6581 is the chip to get as opposed to the 8580 or a swing suit. <laughs> a little bit over my head, Hans. Garen says, the thing about the Mirage and similar area in Sonics was how well they cut through a mix. Yeah, that's for sure. They really do sound great. I love in Sonic. I'm, I'm obsessed. Uh, so anyways, guys, I think that's a good place to call it for the evening. I just want to say thank you guys for being amazing. Continue to be excellent, and I will see you next week, all right? Take care, guys.